Our epistle reading today comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 5. What we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of the darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifest in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. This is the word of the Lord. In the name of Christ, amen. A teacher by the name of Mrs. Thomas taught second grade. And on Fridays, at the end of the school day, she would let the children have 20 minutes of art time. They would do various projects, but on this particular day, it was just a free time of drawing. You can draw whatever you want. So the students went about with their crayons and their paper, and Mrs. Thomas walked around the class and noticed one little girl, Allison, was intensely drawing away, very focused, tongue kind of clenched sticking out of her mouth as she squinted and drew. And she walked up to, to little Allison and she said, what, what are you drawing? And the little girl said, I'm drawing God. And the teacher, Mrs. Thomas, said, well, Allison, no, no one knows what God looks like. And little Allison said, they will in a minute. <laughs> Truth is, we do know what God looks like. Our text this morning tells us exactly what he looks like. Verse 6 of 2 Corinthians 4. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belonging to God and is not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. You want to know what God looks like? If you are a baptized child of God in the faith, just look in a mirror. That's what God looks like. The Apostle Paul tells the church in Corinth that this is the face of Christ on earth. After the ascension, he now walks this place in us, the church. In Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis echoed something that uh, Martin Luther said many, many years before. And he was speaking about the purpose of the church. And C.S. Lewis said, the church exists for nothing else but to draw people to Christ, to make them little Christs. If they are not doing that, all the cathedrals, clergy, missions, sermons, even the Bible itself are simply a waste of time. God became man for no other purpose. He also says the same thing about the, the believer in general. He, he writes, we shall love the Father as Christ does and the Holy Ghost will arise in us. He came to this world and became a man in order to spread to other men the kind of life he has by what I call a good infection. Every Christian is to become a little Christ. The whole purpose of becoming a Christian is nothing else. C.S. Lewis always has a way of putting things, but that's exactly what our text is saying. Christ in us. 
that the face of Christ, this beautiful face of our Savior, this light that shines in the darkness, is actually within us. Colossians 1.26, the mystery hidden for ages and generations is now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now that is some pretty amazing truth that the creator of the universe, God himself, Christ, the savior of all humankind, is in you. And this is not a a textbook. This is not the uh, work of literature or fiction. This is Holy Scripture. So when it says, the face of Christ shines within you, it means it. When it says that the very treasure of God is in you, it means it. When you look to your baptism, to your faith, when you confess this morning that you believe, this is what you believe. Christ is in you. Everything he is, his goodness, his beauty, his majesty, all the wonders that he is and does resides in you, the Christian, the little Christ. Now that's a pretty amazing thing to think about and our text in Corinthians tells us why this is problematic because it tells us that we have this treasure in verse 7 in jars of clay and that's good because as we're told we would get pretty full of ourselves if it wasn't and by jars of clay it means jars that are fragile jars that are made out of dirt, not very pretty all the time. Does this to show the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. These jars mean, verse eight, we are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. And even though the life of Jesus is manifested in us, the death of Christ also is all around us. We are jars of clay, ugly, fragile jars of dirt and water. But those jars contain the amazing treasure of God himself. How seriously do you take that? How seriously do you take the truth of Holy Scripture that in you are all the glorious wonders of the risen Christ? Probably, like me, you struggle with that because of those darn jars of clay. What's your jar of clay? What's the jar that you are that holds this amazing gift, this face of Christ himself? All of us are fragile. All of us are variations of ugly to good looking and it depends on the culture whether you're ugly or good looking or not we all have various health issues the older we get the more fragile we see our body become things start to ache and to hurt and to not work but what about other fragilities of this jar of clay insecurity oh that's a dangerous one How many of us are almost as if we are addicted to an illegal drug, just dragged down by insecurity, held back, in it forming bitterness, rage, anger? Maybe your jar is defensiveness. Don't touch me, I'm fragile. You'll hurt me. Wait a minute, the scripture just told you what is in you is Christ himself. They tried to hurt him. Look what happened. He rose from the dead and will come again to bring us all to eternity. What can hurt you? When you walk through this earth believing 
Well, if I let my guard down, if somebody found this out about me, it's going to damage me. It's going to hurt me. Really? Is it going to hurt Christ? He knows what you did. He knows who you are. He knows all the ugliness. Everything in the jar. Remember, the first human was made out of nothing but dirt and the breath of God. That's the primary ingredient in clay, except when you add some water to it, such as baptism, it becomes moldable into a vessel. The other thing that many of our jars are made about is just ego, assumptions. Ego and, and many of our beliefs about the world are simply calluses on our hands to protect our sensitive skin. We want to make sure nobody can get in, not be vulnerable. We're going to believe what we believe about the world, about other people. We take our own experiences and say, that's all there is. Because you know it's really scary? Do you know it's really overwhelmingly frightening to realize the truth of how little you actually know? I always laugh whenever science, and when you study the history of scientific discovery, every time we discover something, you see this attitude of we've now figured it all out. And then what happens five years later? That ego, which is really nothing more than insecurity, which is really nothing more than a callous because we're scared to death to think of how weak we might truly be. What if we're wrong? What if we don't know? What if, oh my gosh, could it possibly be? No. What if the world really is changing like every day? Have you ever known someone that retired from a field of industry and you're currently in that field? And they retired only 10 years ago, maybe five years ago. And they talk to you and they obviously want to talk about the glory days of when they worked in that field. We all do that or will do that when we retire, especially us guys, because we tend to identify based on our work. But the guy that's still working in the field is listening going, what on earth are you talking about? Because in that five years, everything has changed. Look at the world we live in five years ago compared to today. Imagine what it'll be like five years from now. But we don't like to think about that. So we have a tendency to make this jar, which really is of clay, but to pretend it's it's much stronger than it is. I know how things work. I know how things ought to be. I know what it is. And boy, does it hurt when we realize we're wrong. It's interesting that in our gospel reading, the same old religious authorities try to set Jesus up by seeing if he'll heal somebody on the Sabbath. Because they think they know we'll get him. The law says honor the Sabbath. The law doesn't say how to honor the Sabbath other than to honor and worship the Lord your God on the Sabbath. And Jesus confronts him with that and says, really? I should not show love and compassion and care and heal this person on the Sabbath? Really? And the religious authorities of the day, you could hear them just inside their head going, oh, got us. And did they respond by saying, maybe we should be a little more humble? Maybe we should go, you know what, Jesus? Yeah, you're right. Our insecurity, our ego, our desire for power has gotten in the way of truth. But what do they do instead? Exactly what we would do. Let's get him. And I'm just as guilty of that as anyone else. When somebody hurts you, what do you want to do? Get them. 
So what do we do? Here is this promise. Christ says, the world sees me in you, and in fact, only in you, in the church, in the Holy Scripture that is in us. The face of Christ is your face. We are little Christs. Within us is this amazing treasure, the light that the world needs. Every time you complain about the darkness, you are the answer. Because the light of Christ is in you. But it's in this ugly, fragile, rough jar made out of clay. What do we do? I think the Gospel of Mark, chapter 14, has a, a good answer when it tells us the time that when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, he was reclining at a table and a woman came with an alabaster, alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. And in verse 9 of the text, Jesus says, Truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Here was this woman that had this very precious treasure of this, of this pure nard. Some say that, that a, a flask like that, a pure nard, would be at a price where probably a hundred people could be fed. Now, I don't know exactly how alabaster is made, but I know for a fact there's rocks and dirt and water and it's, it's you know, heat is applied and it's kind of similar to a clay jar. It's just a fancy jar of clay. We like to make our jars of clay look fancy. But what did this woman do? She broke it. Smashed it. There's your answer. Whatever your jar of clay is, whatever is ugly about you, the, the, whatever your health issues, your appearance, your insecurities, your bitterness, your hurts, the assumptions, your, your desire to, to not face up to the changes that happen all around you, to live in the past or just live in some fantasy of things that aren't really what they are, your ego, whatever your jar is that's hiding the treasure, break it, smash it. I'll bet a lot of you here are fond of crab and lobster. I'm not a fan of lobster, too many gooey, ooey parts in lobsters. But crab, crab legs, amazing. I love crab legs. One of my favorite dishes is a, a nicely cooked filet mignon. And yes, I'm trying to make you hungry. A, a, a filet mignon with a Bernay sauce on the top and, and, uh, and uh, just a, a big pile of fresh crab meat on top of that. Maybe a little asparagus on the side. Oh, love it. But here's the question. Who was the person that was walking down a beach one day, thousands of years ago, and saw a crab and said, wow, that looks really good to eat. I mean, they're bugs, for goodness sake. They're disgusting. They're, ugh, they're some of the ugliest creatures on the planet. They're creepy. They're like giant spiders. Have you ever looked at a spider and said, mm, I'm gonna eat that? No. But that's what a crab is. Or a lobster looks like a big cockroach. And somebody went, let's eat that. Imagine how hungry that person had to be. But then imagine the delight. Somebody went, oh my gosh, this is amazing. This is delicious. It was a treasure in an ugly jar. But you never get the crab meat unless you crack the shell. You never get the light. You never get to see the face of Christ unless you break the jar. That face is your face. 
That treasure is your treasure. That light is in you, in your baptism, in the word. You are assured of it when you come to the Lord's Supper, literally, physically, visibly taking in the body and blood of Christ into your clay drawer. It's as though Christ is saying, I know this is hard to believe, so let's literally do it. But so often we just keep it locked up in there. We keep that face hidden from the world that needs you. That is a huge responsibility and an amazing privilege. Within you is the treasure and the face of God. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In the name of that Christ, amen. At this time.